Terry, David, good to be chatting with both of you. Good to see you, Pat. Thanks for having us. We're here, of course, to talk about alternatives, but I wanted to start just, I guess, by setting the scene a little bit and understand why we're talking about alternatives. Why have bond yields been so low for so long? Well, for me, there's really two reasons. The first is that uh, there's not been a huge amount of inflation for the last decade or so. Um, that comes from a lot of the structural factors we see in the economy around the world, globalisation, uh, lower wages. Um, you've had unions that have been become less impactful on driving that wage growth. Um, and also just simply technology change, which makes uh, inflation a, a little bit lower as we become more productive. Um, and then there's also the response to that low inflation. You know, central banks want to create inflation, so the economy runs and they have this idea of a warm inflation, creates warm growth, and they haven't been able to achieve that. So after we saw in 2008 to try and generate that inflation and that growth, they've been throwing everything they can at it. And it's led to this quite, I guess, ugly phrase about financial repression. And it basically just means that bond yields are going to be lower and lower as they try and stimulate that inflation and growth in the economy. And they've opened up that toolkit of policies they have used. And as governments have increased the size of their debt levels, there's now an issue around the sustainability of that debt. And that means borrowing costs need to stay low to make it more affordable for governments to try and do all that stimulus they have been doing for the last two years in response to the pandemic. Do you see this situation changing in the foreseeable future? It kind of feels as though we've been in this mode for, what, 10, 12, maybe even longer years now. Um, why would it change now? There is going to be a change in terms of this cycle compared to the last cycle when it comes to inflation. Inflation pressures are becoming more evident most immediately, but they'll also be stickier than they have been in the past. And some of those inflation things that have caused lower inflation in the past, such as globalization, have shown signs of reversing. And there's also a little bit more of a question mark about exactly what impact things like uh, climate change will have in terms of what hits pricing and what it means for inflation. Um, but we do know it's not going to be uh, outright outrageous inflation that's going to be a problem, but it may be a little bit higher. That leads to bond yields being a little bit higher. But I think the issue is the response from central banks to that higher inflation has also changed. And so while we do think that inflation and yields can move up from where they are today, um, they're probably not going to go back to those levels where they were in the past because there simply won't be the allowance for them to do by what central banks are doing to hold yields down to make borrowing cheap. What do you see as being kind of a neutral rate for, for bonds now? Obviously, it seems so. At the moment, we're in, 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 at an expansionary rate. Where do you see it going over the next few years? Well, if you look at uh, something like our long-term capital forecast, where they look over the next uh, 10 to 12 years in terms of what they think the equilibrium rate will be for, for cash rates and, and treasury yields, it's around about 2%, um, and that's in sort of nominal terms. So if we think about real terms, it's likely to be a lot, lot lower, closer to zero. Uh, and that's the, the world we're in. And that creates some serious problems we think about what bonds do in a portfolio and their role they're meant to play. If we are thinking about real rates that are flat or even negative, and particularly the attractiveness that makes uh, of bonds compared to other assets in that environment. I must admit, Kerry, like it feels sitting here today when we're trying to employ people all people, not just, you know, say financial services specialists, but, uh, you know, admin people, the sales people, the whole works. Um, the labour market is super tight. It's as tight as, like, I've seen it in, in, in our industry in sort of 30 years, and you've got sort of really rapidly rising house prices, you've got supply chain issues that kind of, and even the central banks have sort of stepped back a little bit from saying, it's, it, yes, it's transitory, but that period's going to be probably a little bit longer, and as Kerry said, it's going to come back to a level that is higher than what we probably originally first thought. So sitting here today, it feels, it, it, it doesn't feel like it's going away quickly. No, it's definitely lingering. And it is part of the fact that, you know, the experience of the last year and a half is very unknown. And so the idea around what scars, you know, the COVID pandemic is going to leave on the economy are really only just starting to show. But as we do know, scars fade and they will over time. Well, what does this all mean for investors who hold bonds? Uh, what role can they play? still play in a portfolio now, if there is one? <laughs> well, it's a great question. I mean, clearly at the levels that they're at, they unfortunately can't play the same defensive role that they've played previously, particularly in sort of equity market corrections and so forth. That's not to say they can't play any role. Um, but I think we need to be careful at this point in the cycle of not having all of your fixed in interest exposure at sort of, you know, long duration type assets. and. You know, we have seen in the, the benchmarks themselves, the fixed interest indices themselves, that the duration, which is a measure of really in crude terms, the sensitivity of 
um, of the indices and, and bonds to changes in, in yields and interest rates ha has become a lot longer. It's become a lot longer because both governments and corporates have been taking advantage of the you know, low interest rate environment and, and borrowing for longer. So that in itself makes the indices more sensitive to changes in interest rates which has been and bond yields, which has been terrific on the way down. And you know, passive funds have done exceptionally well in that environment. If we start to get bond yields um, clicking up a bit, um, you know, that, that, that could be quite painful in the sort of short to medium term for um, you know, some of the passive exposures and long duration fixed income uh, funds. Yeah, I think it's the, uh, the roles that you think about bonds playing in the portfolio as a provider of income and a diversifier just become more and more challenged. I mean, these things were <clears throat> the, the safe harbour for many investors in their portfolio. They provided the balance to the, the equity risk they were taking on. And that ballast has just become a little even as we think about what bonds actually offer in terms of protection. I think that's a very different scenario than from saying you shouldn't own bonds, because yeah. I do believe they should. Yeah. Uh, and they do still have that negative correlation with equities. Yeah. But as a diversifier, they're just not as strong as they once were. And, and that's why when we think about how are you going to provide ballast in your portfolio, you just need to look across a range of assets that aren't just in fixed income, that aren't just in, say, other defensive assets as you sort of think about really, truly building a robust portfolio. What about alternatives? What kind of role or why do you think they form an important role in an investor's portfolio? Well, I mean, we think they form an important role, particularly now, because of looking forward, it does look like quite an uncertain environment, investment environment. You know, we still don't know how, um, well, let's hope the end of COVID um, plays out. We, it's been a long period as both you and Kerry have said, Pat, about um, central bank intervention and, you know, that's starting to pare back somewhat. Um, we don't know the outcome of governments um, bringing back their fiscal response to COVID. So, you know, we really feel that um, the inclusion of alternatives and having different sources of return, uh, different correlation to other major asset classes and also defensive qualities. You know, some of the alternative strategies are what we call non-directional. So they're not relying on markets going up all the time to generate returns. There are some sort of shorting abilities um, where if you have market corrections, you can generate returns. So it's all of those reasons that I think, you know, alternatives are critical to the exposure in portfolios um, going forward. Could you tell me a little bit more uh, specifically about some of those strategies and kind of how they meet some of the needs that bond investors might be looking for that are now missing? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question because uh, alternatives in a sense is a bit of a catch-all um, and that's a problem, right? Because there's, there's a, a, a broad range of alternative strategies such as, you know, um, global macro, you know, JP Morgan has a, has a strategy in that space. Um, there is managed futures, um, there's market neutral, and then you look at some of the sort of real assets like, you know, sort of timberland assets, transport assets, um, uh, infrastructure, direct infrastructure, water. So it's, it, it's not a homogenous asset class for one. Uh, some of those are reasonably volatile. Um, and so that can scare some investors, while others, are, you know, they're not, they're not priced daily. In fact, they're priced infrequently. And so there's, you know, I suppose in some ways artificial low volatility. So, you know, I guess some of those real assets, direct assets, you know, potentially could be a substitute for some of the defensive allocation in portfolios. Um, whilst you've got, as I said, managed futures, uh, global macro tend to be, um, you know, more perhaps allocated within the growth component of your portfolio rather than defensive. For us, it's all about <clears throat> just drawing on those points there, Dave. It's about the fact that it's so difficult to, to generate the same levels of alpha and income and diversification from public markets now yeah. uh, compared to the past. Again, if you look at our, our long-term capital market assumptions, 
uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. Back in 2008, uh, a typical 60-40 portfolio was going to give you um, over 7% return over the next decade. You roll forward to what we just did in terms of the long-term capital markets. That same portfolio of traditional assets gives you just over 4%. So it's about how do you get alpha income diversification in your portfolio. You look at the alternative assets and those same characteristics and where they lie, whether it's in the different sort of more liquid strategies, whether it's in the sort of real assets that Dave mentioned there, and the income and diversifications, and you try and supplement them into your portfolio, in our view at least, and that's what we're hearing from our clients, in trying to build up um, something that does replicate what you used to get from public markets. There are challenges there, there's fees, yeah. there's transparency, there's yeah. liquidity. So it's, it's not an easy journey, but this is the, the reality that's facing investors today. It is interesting, Pat, because if you look at the recent sort of uh, your super, your future legislation or regulation, you know, the way that um, the government or APRA is wanting super funds to classify alternatives is, is 50-50 defensive and growth. Um, so, um, but that, is quite unsophisticated and, and, and there's kind of a, a lobby at the moment to talk about well let's not just be that crude Let, let's talk about what are defensive alternatives what are growth alternatives and maybe you know as an example measure of volatility you know is a kind of basic um, measure of maybe allocating which are the growth alternatives which are the defensive alternatives um, but you know that's playing out in the in the super fund space as we speak so you know, that what happens there um, tends to sort of find its way into investor portfolios as well. For you, what, is a, what are the attributes that make a good alternatives manager? Uh, could you maybe compare and contrast as well to more traditional asset managers, what some of the similar things you might be looking for and any points that might be a bit different? Yeah, well, the similar ones are pretty easy, and that is, um, you know, obviously we want quality, experienced people. So, you know, a lot of the, uh, like Managed Futures is a great example, right? So that's a strategy that is, you know, very heavily quantitatively driven. Um, but in our view, you still need great, um, experienced, well-qualified people to drive, drive um, those quantitative models. Um, so it's certainly about, you know, great people, experience through different market cycles, very, very important. Like, you know, you could argue um, there's a lot of investors, you know, we talked about um, the, uh, the rally in bonds, you know, for the last, well, since the GFC, you know, we talk about the um, growth investment style outperforming value for the longest period ever. So there are there's some investors in the market, professional investors, um, that have never lived through, you know, different market cycles. So we really are looking for people that have experienced different market cycles and uh, have great confidence in the investment uh, process and style um, and application through those different market cycles. You know, I think as Kerry said before, perhaps some of the differences are that because you know, a lot of these models are pretty quantitative. Um, they're very heavily academically uh, based. They're, you know, some people call them black box. Um, you really are, I guess, uh, wanting transparency. I mean, you want transparency in, in all managers, but um, you know, it has been historically a space where there has been probably less transparency um, in terms of what you know, managers and investors are doing you know, with their process and kind of under the covers, so to speak. You know, we're looking for true to label. You know, what, what, what you see is what you get. So, as I mentioned before, there are, you know, say managed futures and global macro that can be, you know, higher volatility investment styles, and that's okay. That's okay as long as they're delivering upon the investment objective over the period of time that, you know, they're designed to do. Uh, so, these are the sort of things I think, you know, investors should kind of focus on um, when trying to assess. I think it's an important point because the, <clears throat> the experience that you can have as an investor in alternatives can vary greatly depending on the manager you choose. I mean, if you just think about, like I say, a global equities manager and you compare the different managers and their performance, there's not gonna be a huge difference in what they all return. They're looking at the same data, the same public markets and, and assessing them. Um, granted, they'll have different methodologies, but you know, dispersions of returns is relatively narrow. If you apply that same sort of metric towards you know, core um, alternative managers, it's going to be very, very wide because they are going to be very different. They have a different way of approaching the market and probably slightly different underlying assets they're looking at as well. So manager selection becomes a huge important
deliberate fact and that due diligence you, due diligence you do on that selection is going to ultimately impact your experience with alternatives. And I think perhaps in the Australian context in the past, that may have been uh, detrimental to some investors who have perhaps gone with the wrong manager and have a different experience of, of alternatives. But that's going to be a, a very key thing to thinking about how you add portfolio and um, add alternatives to your portfolio. And then again, if you're thinking about a core alternative, which is going to be lower volatility, maybe more higher income, versus something that's non-core, going to be more opportunistic, maybe a bit more volatility, a bit higher risk, is all going to have a variation in terms of thinking about what it does in your portfolio. I think that's a really good point because, as Kerry said, you know, most people will understand there is a, you know, a share market index. A lot of people will understand there's, there's bond indices. With a lot of the alternatives, there isn't recognised benchmarks. So a lot of the managers are managing to an absolute return type target and or a volatility target. So I think that keeps a lot of people away from alternatives because they don't understand, well, what, you know, what, what, what am I to expect from this fund or manager? You know, is it, you know, it's, it's not like an equities manager. I can at least expect there'll be somewhere around above or below, hopefully above. Um, you know, the share market index, but there isn't kind of recognised indi in, um, indices. There are industry indices, but, you know, the average investor, the advisor, they, they're, you know, they're not familiar with those. It's not like the S&P ASX 200, completely, for example, yeah. Completely, yeah. yeah. yeah.